Mike a little fair on the pastor here at Battle Bay Baptist Church. I'd like to welcome you to this service that we celebrate the life of uh, Jonathan Crowder. Now, I apologies that we've started late. Can I blame modern technology? <laughs> well, I'd like to. Uh, we were trying to live stream it, and at the moment we haven't been able to live stream, so we're actually recording the service and we'll put it up online later on. For those who may be overseas and would like to be seeing it, uh, and for other church family and friends who would like to be able to see. But there are a number of people here in the building, there's a large number of people in the building, and it's a testimony, I think, to Jonathan's life. Uh, how he's touched so many people over so many years. Today we meet to celebrate Jonathan's life. Uh, the service sheet we have today doesn't say funeral service or memorial service because today is a celebration of Jonathan's life. Uh, today we'll uh, have some memories shared of Jonathan, we'll hear from family, we'll sing some songs that songs that Jonathan would love for us to sing, and today we'll honour God, a loving God who Jonathan relied upon and trusted in, or trusted in through his whole life. This is a God in his kindness who gave Jonathan a long life. And if you do the maths on the front of the service sheet, you'll see that Jonathan was 87. Yeah, God in his goodness gave Jonathan a long life actually have much to be thankful for, especially the way God has blessed Jonathan's life. And we'll also be thankful that God brought Jonathan and Marina together and gave them a long marriage. 60 years of marriage, celebrated not so long ago. Uh, Jonathan and Marina have a loving family, which we can thank God for, children, grandchildren, and God has given Jonathan and Marina some loving church families, places of deep love and friendship. We actually have much to celebrate and thank God for in our time together today. The greatest reason we can celebrate and give thanks is that Jonathan had a faith in the Lord Jesus. Because Jonathan was loved by Jesus and forgiven by Jesus, we know that today Jonathan is with his saviour, the Lord Jesus, who is in paradise. I'd like to read to you some words from our service sheet. They're printed on the top left-hand side of the inside cover of the service handout. These are some words that were spoken by Jesus when he was at a funeral service. In John chapter 11, verse 25, we read this. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Well, Jonathan certainly believed this to be true. He lived out a trust in Jesus. He was confident that death was not the end. Jonathan knew that his body would pass away, but he knew that he'd be in paradise with God forever. And I guess Jonathan would want each of us today to ask ourselves, do we believe this to be true? As we start our time together today, it's appropriate to come before the Lord God in prayer. Today is an emotional day, it's a sad day for, for many, so we want to ask God for his strength and his comfort for all of us as we join them in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your amazing love, for your faithfulness to us. Thank you for the wonderful promises that you've made to those who follow Jesus. Thank you that Jonathan knew Jesus as his saviour, that he now knows the warmth of your embrace and the joy of being in Lord God, we know that talking about Jonathan today can cause us to miss his power. So we ask for your strength and your peace in our time together. Please help those who speak today, give them strength and comfort. May the memories that are, sh are shared fill us with joy about our dear friend and family member. By the power of your spirit, we pray that the word from God will fill us with comfort and bring us hope today and in the days ahead. going to sing a song called Amazing Grace. Uh, the words in this song remind us that it's by God's grace, by his undeserved favour, uh, that we're welcomed into his family. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, a man called John Newton wrote this song. He was completely transformed. He was forgiven by God and his life was changed by God's grace. And I guess in the same way, God's grace completely transformed. 
Music team, you got to lead us in this song. We have Marion and Nicola and Joan. And we're all going to stand and we're going to sing. The words are on our service sheet and they'll also be on the screen. Let's stand and sing this song. <laughs> be seated. Uh, a few family members are going to come and share a little bit about Jonathan's life. We have our son Dominic who's going to come and share and De Villiers, uh, brother and uh, also granddaughter Lauren. So I'm going to give you a microphone even though there's a microphone here I'm going to give you a microphone because I think it might have been cutting in and out before. So I'm going to give you a different microphone that I hope will be more reliable. Good deal. Thank you. My dad was born on the 26th of June, 1937, in Mufarera, the Copper Belt, northern Rhodesia, now known as Zambia. One of five children, he had many names. Jonathan to his mother, Johnny to his wife and friends, dad to his kids, grandpa or Kulu to his grandkids, Buti, to his siblings, Uncle Johnny, to his nieces, nephews, and our friends, JC, to his work colleagues, Colonel JC, to his army mates. He had many occupations as well. He was a boilermaker, a ship's engineer, a car salesman, an inventor, a contractor, and a lumberjack, just to mention a few. Growing up in northern Rhodesia presented many adventures for Dad, one of which he couldn't resist, was going hunting by himself for man-eating lions with a toy popcorn at about the age of four. Aunt Edna, who I think even the police were scared of, uh, told the police to find him, give him a hide him and bring him home. I'm not too sure if they followed, the, <laughs> followed her orders, but they did bring him home safely. He was schooled at the convent, where, when he wasn't playing truant, that was. <laughs> he used to spend most of his time fishing in the Kafui, which is probably one of the most croc-infested rivers in Zambia, and often got top, 
uh, tipped into it after the tribesmen wanted to return their, their canoes that he had stolen from the riverbank. These are just some of the many stories that he had when he was growing up. After that, he did his apprenticeship on the mine as a boilermaker, the copper mines in Zambia. And the mischief didn't stop there. He once heated up the workbench with a cutting torch just before the foreman sat down on it to give them all a, a talking to. <laughs> After his apprenticeship, he traveled. He went by sea around the world, ending up in the UK with a mate from the mine, Taffy Williams, whose grandparents lived in Swansea, Wales. They threw a 21st birthday party for him, and Dad went along, and he loved Swansea, and started working there. He was known in the pub by the local rugby players as Johnny Bach, which in Welsh is Johnny Friend, or the boy from Africa, another one of his many names. This is where he met Mum. They were engaged on the 16th of January, 1963, Mum's 19th birthday, and got married in Zambia the 1st of August, 1964. They were together for 60 years. Jace, my, old, my brother, was born a year later, and I came along two years after that, the best wedding present that they could ever have on the 1st of August, 1967. <laughs> It seemed that the 1st of August was the day that the family did our moving. We moved to Rhodesia the following year, 1968, to Salisbury, and then again to Amtali, the eastern districts of Rhodesia, in 1979. During the Bush War, Dad did his national service, his army. He was known as JC, as I said, by his army mates, until somebody put out a rumor that JC was actually the colonel, and the colonel was a decoy in case they tried to take him out. The crazy thing was, everyone, including the colonel, played along with it. And at the end of the year, he was sent a gilt-edged invitation to the officer's dance, addressed to Colonel JC. <laughs> He was also a great tease. He loved teasing us, our friends, and his grandkids. One of his favorite things to do was pinch us under the table with his toes, or torment us with the gugavink. This was a flying tickle monster, which now torments his grandkids. Crazy things that we passed down. His grandkids would always have to tell them the password, I love grandpa. He would tell them, Grandpa only teases the ones he loves. He used to tell them, go down to the nature strip and bring me a stick, a big stick. I want to give you a hiding. When Lauren came to the hospital to say goodbye to him on the day that he passed, he gave her a big smile to greet her. She asked him, what size stick shall I bring you, Grandpa? And he held out his hands by about half a meter. He said that the reason he wanted us all to go to Rhodesia rather than South Africa was to give us his kids the bush life that he had had. He said that we lived in the most beautiful country in the world and even a war wasn't going to stop us from seeing it. He took us to places almost untouched by human hands. We did game viewing holidays and fishing trips. We used to call him the big white game hunter because one of the occasion, these holidays with our friends, the Arnolds, we were at a little game park just outside Salisbury looking for rhino. We hadn't seen them the whole weekend. When we saw a mum and baby in the distance, so dad got out of the, lay across the bonnet of the Land Rover we'd borrowed from work and took a film with his trusty 8mm Sydney camera, only to notice 
once he got back into the Land Rover, that the male rhino was right next to the road on his side. How he saw it, I don't know. <laughs> One of these many things that always got to me was no matter where we went, he would always meet up with somebody that he knew. Rhodesia changed its name to Zimbabwe in 1983. In, sorry, 1980. And in the war, it had come to an end. And the finances and the standard of education had dropped drastically. And in 1983, the writing was on the wall. Dad decided that we needed to move. We applied to immigrate to Australia, but Australia wasn't ready for us yet. And our application got refused. So being of South African heritage, we went there instead. In South Africa, in 1994, he came to know the Lord, one of his greatest passions. He was a hard-working gentleman who taught us to respect, to love, and to care for our mother. In fact, he made us promise, made me promise, on my 21st birthday to take care of her no matter what happened to him. We did our trades in South Africa, and Jace traveled overseas, and I did my national service. I lived there until the second, sorry, April, 20, uh, April 2002, when I immigrated to Australia. Mum and Dad followed me on the 2nd of December of the same year. Jace had moved to Australia with his partner, Sean, who he had met in the UK so many years before. Now they have two lovely girls, Claudia and Lauren. Dad always thought that we were extremely blessed to live in Australia. He loved the country and he appreciated the way of life, often commenting, we would never have this or that if we were still living in South Africa. He will be missed, remembered, and with fond, a fond heart, and probably a lot of good old laughs about the good old days. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm the baby brother. <laughs> uh, I didn't have a privilege as a child <clears throat> to grow up with my brothers. They were much older than me. By the time they came into my life, I was still in primary school. But I will always have fond memories of Jonathan. As a child, as Dominic said, uh, they are a little bit younger than me, but uh, we experience more or less the same teasing and everything. And after I stopped, started working, and every year when our dad sorry, when it was his birthday, we all got together. Always. <clears throat> and it was the family joke that those days that me being the youngest, I had to do the braai every time. And <laughs> I remember <clears throat> one year we, my wife and I, decided we're going to have them do it. <laughs> so we went late. We were supposed to be there by about uh, 1 p.m. And uh, we got there at after 3 p.m. <laughs> hoping that the bride would be done and ready for us. But no chance. They said no, they kept the fire going for me. 
And what I will always remember about those days as well, uh, Jonathan was always the light of the gathering. Laughing loud, making jokes, and trying to teach me to keep up with him in beer drinking. But he never succeeded. <laughs> because whenever he got up to go and find another beer, I used to pour the one I had out on the lawn. <laughs> but those were fond memories. But my greatest memories came later. When I was a, <coughs> sorry, a father already. And one day... Jonathan phoned me. Now, my dad and all three of his sons were Freemasons. And Jonathan said, Dad, we're in the wrong thing. And he had a peculiar way of persuading people. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he convinced me and my, our eldest brother that we should part ways with Freemasonry. And uh, for that, I will always be grateful to him. The Lord has blessed me with a genuine brother, <coughs> a family man. I know he was a loving and doting father, husband, and he cared for his broader family <coughs> very, very much. So today, I just want to thank the Lord for blessing all of us to have had him, <coughs> sorry, in our lives. And the impression he has made will always be there, the fond memories, and he will be dearly missed and remembered. And I also thank the Lord that we can know today that he is dancing. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm Lauren, Jonathan's granddaughter. I'm going to share some memories um, of my grandpa that my sister and I wrote together, Claudia. Claudia and I both have very fond memories of the time that we spent at my granny and grandpa's house. Grandpa was a huge jokester and would always greet us by saying, go out the back and fetch a big stick so I can hit you with it. <laughs> After we convinced him that the stick wasn't necessary, grandpa would tell us, tell your parents to leave so I can spoil you. And then the fun would begin. Weekends with Grandpa always, sorry, included important life lessons like how to check the oil in your car, how to pour the perfect beer, and how to whip a snip barefoot, as well as visits from the ruthless tickle monster known as the Gook of Ink. You should consider yourself very lucky if you've never met him. Grandpa was a hard worker. He instilled the importance of a good work ethic in us while we helped him in his workshop, where he showed us how to use basic tools, spray paint, and make repairs with e-proxy, while also having a lot of fun along the way. He also paid attention to our interests and incorporated them into his projects. For example, when Claudia showed an interest in archery, he made her bow and, ar a bow and arrows, which he loved very much, and our parents loved slightly less. It wasn't all hard work at Grandpa's. He also loved to spend time relaxing outside and enjoying nature. We had a lot of fun exploring the beach at Spoon Bay together and feeding the lorikeets that would land on Granny and Grandpa's balcony to eat slices of, ap of apples out of his hand. As we got older, I really appreciated how Grandpa welcomed my boyfriend Jeremy into the family and thought of him as a grandson of his own. He loved when he visited and as a fellow tradesman bonded over business, tools and various projects he was completing. Grandpa had an optimistic outview on life. He always reminded us how blessed we were, particularly that we all lived together in a safe and beautiful place. 
We are so grateful that Granny and Grandpa came to Australia when we were young children. Shortly after their arrival, Claudia and I both remember looking out of the crowd from the stage of our school concert and seeing Granny and Grandpa sitting there with Mum and Dad. We didn't have grandparents or many relatives that lived close by, so we were excited to be able to share many more memories with them over the years. We will miss our grandpa very much, but we'll remember the special times we had with him. Thank you. So I'm just re gonna read a couple of words from Bernice, who is Jonathan's niece, um, who unfortunately couldn't attend today. Uncle Jonathan, my favorite uncle, thank you for the love and positive influence that you had in my life, especially in my growing up years. You tease me so much, but that taught me a good life skill, learning to laugh at myself. You taught me how to play chess, a game which I have passed on to my own grandchildren. You even showed me how to weld, but I'm not sure I took anything away from that lesson. You impressed me by all those languages I thought you could speak. Fortunately, we only practiced speaking Afrikaans at the dinner table, as I later learned that was only the real lang the, really the only language that you were able to speak. I'm so sad that I did not make it to give you a last hug before you left us, but the wonderful memories that I have of you will keep my heart full. Annie Marina, Jonathan, Dominic, Div, and your beautiful families, we send extra love to you all while you adjust to a life without Uncle Jonathan. Heaven is so lucky to have received an angel, especially a handsome one that hums. We will miss you. Much love, your favourite niece. Thank you for all those memories that you've shared. Uh, it's been very helpful to know more of Jonathan and who he is and the person he is. Uh, lots of us have only known him the last few years. Uh, we have another way of actually sharing more memories, and that is the family have opened the photo album for us. So we actually now have uh, a photo tribute prepared by Marina and Nicola. So thanks for that. We'll watch it on the screen now. Jesus, all our sins increase to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often fall.
thank you for that photo tribute. I'll invite the music team to come back forward to lead us in another song. The song is Psalm 23. Uh, the words remind us that God is like a good shepherd who's leading us. And with him leading us, we have no need to fear because God has good plans for us. So let's stand and sing together Psalm 23. may be seated. Uh, in your handout, you'll have noticed that there's some Bible readings. We're going to hear some Bible readings now. Uh, Ralph's going to come up and share a Bible reading, share some memories first, and then Jim's going to come up and share another Bible reading and lead us in prayer. Thank you. When I saw that photo on the front there, it was, I could see why you fell for that man. <laughs> we didn't, re didn't recognise him because we only remembered Jonathan as a grey old man like me, you know. <laughs> so it was good to see a young Jonathan there. Better put my glasses. My brother Jonathan in Christ I first met and became friends with about 14 years ago. Um, the first time I heard about Jonathan was when the deacon of our church, which I attend, met Jonathan and he said that he met a very interesting man. It was, <laughs> that was Ronnie, Ronnie Voss. And he gave him a book to read about Islam. My wife Ava and I got to meet Marina and Jonathan and we became good friends ever since. And we, I mentioned Marina because we were, when jo where Jonathan was, Marina was also always, they were always together. And we d developed a great friendship. And I would like to just share a couple of memories we have of Jonathan 
since he's, well, since he's passed into glory. Uh, I asked Jonathan to speak at our men's breakfast at our church about his life journey and a testimony, a testimony about his Christian walk and his conversion. Well, as Dominic said and talked about some of the stories, he only got as far as North Transvaal and he ran out of time because, it, I mean, I've never experienced a man who had so many experiences. It was a wonderful time of um, sharing and, of course, also the testimony he gave when he gave his life to the Lord and he's, he's been, he's ever, ever always thanked the Lord for that wonderful conversion that he, that the Lord gave him. We got to know Jonathan and Marina very well during our lunches and dinners together and I always loved Marina's lunches and dinners. She's just a wonderful cook. But I would just also like to say that having lunches and dinners together is a wonderful way of communicating. So often nowadays we don't have time to communicate and lunches and dinners is a wonderful time to get to know each other and to just share and to have conversations and to be a help and a strength for each other. I was a painter all my life and I know that Jonathan only really knew two colours, black and white. <laughs> uh, I'm, and I must mention this one, this memory I have, and I think it was in this church, we went to a political, I think it was a rally or a, a uh, getting to appoint some people for the different electorates and the one electorate that was where a man was standing, he, um, he had some problems and John, Jonathan was going to tell him in no way that he better fix his own problems first before he could stand as, as you know, for parliament or anything like that. The only problem was that the, the man was a, I don't think he's here, I hope not, he was a heavyweight champion, champion boxer. <laughs> that was the one time I, was, I convinced Jonathan not to continue with that, <laughs> that avenue. Jonathan loved fixing things, as we have heard this morning, and he did help me fix up a few things, and uh, it was a wonderful time. And I know that house that they lived in, in, in Bado Bay, they must have needed a bulldozer because boy, he spent some time fixing that place up. It was, it was a, it's an ongoing job and it was a, kept him busy. It was a really, and yeah, it was great. The garage or shed was his, to me was his pride and joy. Whenever I went there, he, I'd have to go to the shed and see what he was doing or uh, you know, if I, you know, I, I would bring him some stuff. And it was, it was like a, second-hand Bunnings. And the good thing was, <laughs> the good thing was he knew exactly where everything was. I mean, it was, he had it everywhere. I think of the stories of, they told us about Marina and Jonathan delivering groceries and in their little car and the different places they used to go to. And look at it now, Coles and Woolworths have got cars running 24, trucks running 24-7, you know, and um, yeah, it's, there in their little car. The great, I remember the great frustrations Jonathan had with not able to do enough to fix the world's problems to make it a better place. And two things that stand out most in, for me in the latter years of his life that, that he loved his Lord and Saviour and that he was a real prayer warrior. He was always I remember a time when you didn't, you didn't ring a certain time because Jonathan and, Mar and Marina would have that time of prayer set aside and it was a wonderful thing to have. The second thing is that Jonathan's life in times wasn't easy, spiritual, financial and physically, but Jonathan always had learned to be content 
content with the many blessings he received. And I used to love the way he used to go, or that, you know, he had that, had to go. <laughs> anyway, he said, I was, I'm blessed to have my Lord and Saviour. I'm blessed to have a wonderful wife. I'm blessed to have a wonderful family. He was, he was really thankful for the Lord for all the many blessings, although they might have been few. Like financially. And I'm sure that that is something we learn when we study God's word and have Jesus as our, Jesus as our saviour. When we say our goodbyes after we left, after we leave each other's place, he calls me bro. Now, nobody ever used to call me bro, and I wondered what it was, but I think it's just short for brother, but... Um, it's used all the time now, and I used to call him a mate. That was our Aussie way of saying things. And that, was, and that is what Jonathan was to me, a, bro a brother in Christ and a mate. And I'm sure that he's now with his Lord and Saviour, and we thank you for his life. Psalm 130, it's a psalm I've read a long time, a lot of times, and I'm sure Jonathan's read a lot of times and has helped us out of uh, lots of different issues in life, where the Lord says, out of the depth I cry to you, O Lord, O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my, for, to my cry for mercy. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I put hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than watchmen wait for morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will remain, redeem Israel from all their sins. Thank you. Actually, I was up on that screen. I was one of the, I was the least of the two wise men <laughs> up there. Jonathan was the wise one. It's a wonderful reading this morning. A new heaven and a new earth from Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 to 6. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Just moving to a short time of prayer. Lord God, we thank you for the life of Jonathan. We thank you for Jonathan's love of Jesus as his saviour. And we are comforted and assured that Jonathan will be in heaven to worship the Lord our God forever. We thank you for the passion Jonathan had in wanting to share the good news of Jesus with all those whom he met. We thank you for Jonathan's love of his family and his commitment to his wife, Marina. Amen. Lord our God, you give and you take away. 
You bless us through the gift of Jonathan, who is now taken from us and whose loss we mourn. Particularly at this time, we think of Marina and the family. Surround them with your love that they may not be overwhelmed by their loss. Help them through their tears and pain to glimpse the, the, your handiwork at work, to bring blessing out of grief, to be glory to you forever and ever. Amen. God, our Father, we thank you that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to die for us and rise again. His cross declares your love to be without limit. His resurrection and death, death, our last enemy, is doomed. By his victory, we are assured of the promises that you will never leave us or forsake us, that neither death nor life, nor things present nor things to come, can separate us from your love in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. We say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Well, I've only had the opportunity to know Jonathan <coughs> these last few years uh, at the church, uh, as well as that's still working. I didn't realise that was even still working. I thought that was off. Maybe we can turn line seven off. Thanks, Phil. <laughs> so I've only known Jonathan the last few years here at the church, and uh, it's been a privilege to know Jonathan. Uh, I've been here at the church, uh, speaking at church, but I've also known in the last year Jonathan and Marina from Connect Group, from Bible Study, so it's been a lovely way to get to know them more as we've looked at God's Word together. Uh, But I think the way probably I've got to know Jonathan the most in recent years has been the correspondence that he sent me. Uh, Now, I don't think I'm alone in getting emails from Jonathan. Um, I, I don't know, is there a number of people here who used to get regular emails from Jonathan? <laughs> yeah, I think that's probably half of the building here, uh, isn't it? Uh, now, there was no doubt as to where Jonathan stood with his views, was there? Uh, especially his political views. Uh, it was very clear to us all. I guess it shows the fact that Jonathan's opinions and thoughts were never hidden, were they? Uh, on my notice board is a letter from Jonathan. Here's the opening sentence for this letter. There are some matters I'd like to discuss urgently with you because the church is becoming more and more dysfunctional. (laughs) The object is for correction, not criticism. Uh, Jonathan's opinions, they weren't hidden, were they? Uh, There's no doubt that he could be a little bit, can I say this, Marina, a little bit feisty, maybe. (laughs) I've had a number of robust conversations with Jonathan where he's wanted to to share his thoughts on something, and he's wanted his thoughts to become my thoughts on the same subject matter. Now, I've got to admit, being corrected by Jonathan was not always fun, but Jonathan was a friend. In fact, he was more than that. He was a brother. He was a brother in Jesus Christ, in God's family. There's no question that we will miss Jonathan. One of the things that I think we'll miss the most is his passion for Jesus. Uh, while his letters, while his emails could occasionally be, be rather direct, rather blunt, the purpose of his letters and emails were always the same truth. He wanted Jesus to be acknowledged. He wanted Jesus to be honoured by people. He wanted God's values to be the values by which we lived our lives. In all his emails, it, it was clear that Jonathan had a real relationship with Jesus Christ. In those words that Ralph read to us a few minutes ago from the Bible, from Psalm 130, it could easily have been said by Jonathan rather than the psalmist. In that line with the number, in that, uh, that first reading, Psalm 130, the line number two, it said this, Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of my sins, Lord, who could stand but with you, Lord, There is forgiveness. It was an interesting word in there, sin. Sin's a word that's not used much in our world today. It's basically a way of saying, I've not lived God's way. 
it's a way of saying that my relationship with God is not what it should be because I've ignored God's way. I've done my own thing. The Bible describes sin like a disease. It leads to us being separated from God, from a holy God. But the good news of the Bible is that in God, there's forgiveness. And that's through the death of Jesus on the cross for us. And when people trust in Jesus, when they look to him for forgiveness, they're right with God. They can be accepted into his family. That's the truth that Jonathan relied upon in his life. It was the truth that Jonathan rejoiced about. In that line with number five, the psalmist says this. He says, I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits and in his word I put my hope. Jonathan loved the Lord. There's no question of that. Those that have been in Bible study group with Jonathan, they knew that his hope was in Jesus. To, to listen to Jonathan pray was to hear his passion that other people would know that same hope of God's word. And Jonathan didn't just pray about it. He actually did something about it. He was active in sharing. I want to throw up a photo for you. Uh, Jim's already referenced it. Here's the photo, similar kind of photo, to prove that Jonathan was a wise man. And uh, here he is, that intent concentration as a wise man giving out his gold, frankincense and myrrh. But notice who he's giving it to. He's giving it to children, to families. It was an event here at church where people came to hear about Jesus. You see, Jonathan knew that that hope of knowing Jesus, that good news of Jesus, wasn't something for just him. It had to be shared with other people. He wanted them to know that hope also. That's what I really loved and appreciated about Jonathan. Some months ago, I visited Jonathan and Marina. Uh, the purpose of the visit was to discuss baptism, another one of Jonathan's passions. Uh, the subject of dozens of emails on my computer at home. And while I was at their house, I was served, what would it be? Scones with jam and cream. Uh, always the kind of same subject, uh, always the same uh, routine of the scones with the jam and cream. And, and the subject there became Jonathan's health. Jonathan knew the prognosis of his condition. He knew that the last few years were not good. He knew that it would end in death. But here's what he said. I remember it very clearly. He said, I'm not afraid of dying. Certainly he was sad for Marina. He was sad to not be with her. But without hesitation, he could say, the world might be afraid of death, but not me. I'm not afraid of death. Jonathan's hope was given to him by God. Jonathan's confidence was in an eternal home and it would be a wonderful home for those who trust in Jesus. In that passage that Jim read to us from Revelation, we have a description of what this future is going to be like for God's people. It's a glimpse of the glory. It's a glimpse of the celebration. It's a glimpse of the victory that is there for God's people. Listen to what that first line of our second reading says. This man, John, who's been given this vision, he says this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. See, the Bible's talking about something that's so much bigger, so, so much better than just going to a better place. Because this is nothing less than a new heaven, a new earth. It's so much more. It's a new and wonderful existence. And how good this eternal home is for followers of Jesus, like Jonathan, is highlighted in verse 4, where it says this. It says, He, God, that is, God will wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death, nor mourning, nor crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. What a beautiful picture that is for us today to celebrate in. God himself with his people personally wiping every tear from their eyes. As a follower of Jesus, 
Jonathan had already begun to taste the personal closeness of this relationship with God in his life. But now, he's experiencing it in an even more real and an even more personal, beautiful way. And not only will God's people experience this personal closeness with God, we're told that everything that spoils life in this world, we've heard good memories today, but you know what? In our lives, there's bad memories as well because so much spoils our life, but in this world to come, that will all be gone. It's a place with no sickness, no headaches, no family disputes or arguments, no politics, no terrorism, no death. God is going to renew his creation so that it becomes what it's intended to be. The point is, this heavenly existence is real. It's not some mythical, mystical existence where we float around in a heavenly realm. It's real. It was only a few weeks ago that I had a Sunday morning text message from Marina uh, saying that Jonathan had taken a turn for the worst. I said that I'd come when church was over. Unfortunately, Jonathan went to his eternal home before Sunday morning morning church had finished that day. I'm sad that I didn't get to visit one more time. I'm sad that I didn't get to encourage Jonathan as he went to be with the Lord Jesus. But I'm comforted that it's not goodbye forever. I know that Jonathan is with the Lord. I know that he's enjoying his eternal rest. And so often in our lives, we're so full, so busy that we don't take time to think about Jesus. In fact, we think we don't even need Jesus. For many people today, they simply think that believing in God is a crutch for people who need help. And so people don't take the time to acknowledge who Jesus is and what he's done. It's occasions like today that I'm reminded of the fact that we need Jesus. Jesus is not old-fashioned, not past to use by date. No, we need to cling to Jesus through this life. We need to cling to Jesus, to his death and his resurrection, for life beyond the grave. Will you pray with me that we'd be people who do that? Let's pray. Having heard these words of the Bible, remember Jonathan today, Lord God, we know that you love us, that you're an ever, you give us an everlasting love. In fact, we know, Lord, that you turn the shadow of death into the brightness of morning. And we thank you that Jesus is the exalted king who has conquered death. And we thank you that Jesus has made it possible for us to go to a heavenly home that's far better than this world. And Lord, we ask that these words from the Bible about your love and care, that they might bring us encouragement and hope. Lord, today we recognise our need of Jesus. We ask that you'd help us to follow Jesus. Please help us to trust and obey him and to rely on him in life. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask the music team to come forward to lead us in one last song. Uh, <clears throat> the words of the song, How Great Thou Art, are quite powerful. Uh, I'd like to point out to you the, the words of verse 4. Uh, in verse 4 it says, When Christ shall come, with shout of acclamation, and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart, then I shall bow in humble adoration, and there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. Uh, Jonathan would have loved to sing this, I can almost imagine him standing there where he used to be in church every Sunday, singing it with great gusto, so why don't we stand and proclaim how great God is by singing how great thou art.
Well, it's been good to be here. What a character. You could go on talking about Jonathan, couldn't you? I've learned so much today about a man that I thought I knew. <laughs> There's an opportunity after the service in the back hall where, around some refreshments to keep on talking about Jonathan and to catch up with one another and to encourage one another. It's been great to be able to pay tribute to him and to be comforted by God's word and the company of friends and family. May God bless you all. Now let me just conclude our service together here uh, with this benediction. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, because in his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance which can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for all who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation which is ready to be revealed in the last time. May he bless you and keep you. May the Lord fill your hearts with gratitude that Jonathan will not be abandoned to the grave because the Lord made known to him the path of life. And he is now filled with joy in God's presence with eternal pleasures at his right hand. May the Lord be your shepherd who will lead you beside quiet waters and will restore your soul and be with you and comfort you as you walk through the valley of the shadow of death. May the Lord's goodness and love follow you all the days of your life. And may you dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. God bless you. When peace love